So good afternoon. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I've always grown grown up on the farm. We they moved the sap house down by the house when I was about five years old. So we always had people in and explain to them how we make maple syrup. So it's always been part of my upbringing. And then when I started working at Merle Maple, it's also the maple industry's upbringing, you're know, not upbringing, but you know, way to do things. So I really enjoy it. And um, I always wanted to do something with my chemistry education in the ag industry. So it really just, I'm very happy with what I'm doing right now. So, um, okay. So why do we want to measure the amount of inverted syrup, sugar in maple syrup. Pretty much just to optimize the quality of value-added products. We should all want to put out high quality products on the market because if somebody gets a hold of a, a product that's not of high quality, they may never come back to maple again. And it hurts the whole industry, not just whoever's product that was. Um, so the three things I'm gonna talk about are the maple sugar candy, maple spread, which um, is also known as maple cream. Um, at Merle Maple, we stopped calling it maple spread before I started there. Um, and um, mostly just to get away from the question, is there dairy in it? So if I say maple spread, I mean maple cream. Sometimes I still call it maple cream because that's how I grew up. And then I'm gonna talk about granulated maple sugar also. So factors that affect your invert level is your cleanliness of your sap tubing. So while yes, you need to change out that drop line every year or wash it and put it back in the woods. Um, the other reason for doing that is to keep your invert level low so that you um, have a higher quality maple product coming out at, at the evaporator. Um, the other thing is the percentage of red maples tapped in your woodlot. Red maple trees, we've discovered just the last few years, more or less, that they have a lower invert level than um, the hard maples. We always thought, oh, don't tap anything but hard maples. Well, now um, I know my, my, my family, as well as Merle Maple, we have all pretty much been taught, don't, don't tap anything but a hard maple and pretty much cut them all down. And now we're thinking, oh, we should have left some of them there. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, if you have about 40%, um, soft maples or red maples in your woodlot, we've found that your invert level is going to be very low and you really don't, then it's really not a problem. Um, it, it just depends on what your percentage is or if you have any at all. So what do we mean by invert levels and how do we measure invert levels? Um, sap is believed to come out of the tree at 100% sucrose. Then there's hydroly hydrolysis takes place and it breaks down the sucrose into glucose and fructose in equal amounts. So one sucrose breaks down into one glucose, one fructose. And that's done by the induction of yeast, introduction of yeast that's in, naturally in the environment. Um, you can also do this by um, invertase, which is an enzyme that you can add to maple syrup to break it down, or you can do this by um, acid hydrolysis. Um, the yeast is essentially inverting the sucrose into glucose and fructose um, by adding water across the oxygen bond um, in the center. And now the chemist in me made me put this slide in. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> There's only a little chemistry involved. Um, so this whole thing is the sucrose molecule. And then this part of the molecule breaks down and is glucose. So this oxygen stays with the glucose and it gets a hydrogen from the water. And then the fructose gets an oxygen and a hydrogen from the rest of the water. And that gives you stable compounds. So it's a one to one to one ratio. So by measuring the amount of glucose that is present in, um, in your maple syrup, you know how much of it has been inverted to, um, from sucrose. And this is the same glucose the diabetics measure with for in their, in their um, blood. So how do we measure the amount of inverted sugar in maple syrup? One of the ways we've figured out to do it is the glu glucosometer. Um, 
The New York State Maple Confections Notebook was put together by Cornell Maple Program, um, one of the places that Adam Wilde works, and, um, and Aaron Wright, and actually Steve Childs was the one that really put the notebook originally together. Um, but he f determined that the Ac Acucheck Avia, which is pictured here um, in the picture, is the best meter to try and measure your glucose content in maple syrup. And you do that by doing a one to 10 dilution. So you take one gram, there's a, it's hard to tell, but there's a little scale here and you can get those for um, 10 to $15 off the internet, you know, but you take one gram of syrup, maple syrup, and then dilute it up to 10 grams with water. And then you just dip your glucose test strip into it and you read it off of a chart that is in the, the uh, Confections Ma Maple Notebook by Cornell program. It'd be on their web Maple website. And this is the chart. Um, so they went through and figured out all, you know, okay, if you get a reading from column B, because that's a US meter reading, so you don't want to use the European ones. It's given in milligrams per deciliter. So if you come up with a, a reading of 50, um, you read over to, this is supposed to be one to 10 percent, one to 10 dilute. Um, that was an error on the chart and I never changed it, but this will give you the percent invert. So you end up with a 1% invert. So, um, you know, it's pretty easy to read off the chart. You just, it's always column B and column E that we use. And like I said, I'm sure it's on the, the uh, Cornell Maple website. Um, this actually goes from, 1% glucose all the way up to 10%. And then if it's higher than that, you'd obviously have to dilute your sample down more. Um, you can do your dilution with using milligrams or milliliters rather. Um, you can take one milliliter and dilute it up to 10 milliliters, but it's not quite as accurate of a measurement. So you might, your, your number might fluctuate, but it would still give you a ballpark figure. Um, the drawback to this, to doing it with the glucose meter is um, it only goes down to 20 milligrams per deciliter because if you have less sugar than that in your body, um, you have other problems. <laughs> um, so another way to do a glucose reading is with a, a YSI bioanalyzer. This one in particular, is owned by the Western New York Maple Producers Association. It was purchased through a grant from the Rochester Regional Valley Market in Rochester, New York, or Genesee Valley Regional Market in Rochester, New York. And um, I, it's housed at Merle Maple and I'm pretty much the runner of it. No one else wants to touch it. <laughs> um, but basically it, um, we, there's standards that, come, that we purchase with it. And it measures conductivity across a, a really small membrane and, um, to, and it's specific to the glucose. Um, we do, I do, do run samples for a variety of people in Western New York. Um, that's why it was purchased for West, by Western New York. But you know, not everyone can run this. It's an, it was an expensive piece of equipment. And the, um, the membranes and the buffers and everything and the standards you have to buy are, are somewhat expensive. So we do just charge a small fee and then provide these, this information to other producers. Um, this machine can also test the percentage of alcohol. So then when the bourbon alcohol came along, um, we started testing the percentage of alcohol in bourbon samples. So, and that has a different membrane and has different buffers and different um, um, standards. Okay, so now let's talk about the products. If I can get it to go, there we go. Making sugar, make, maple sugar candy. Historically, sugar candy was made out of just early season syrup. It was your lighter in color, your lower in glucose naturally, um, and your sugar kept better. My, um, excuse me a moment. I've got to get my battery. I charged this. Can you? Okay. 
I charged this before we came, but clearly the charge doesn't last very long. Okay, there we go. Now I won't run out. Um, sorry. So now maple producers want to draw, use more than just your first draw of the evaporator to make maple sugar candy. Um, it can be made out of any syrup, but you're, it's going to keep much longer if um, you have a low invert percentage in your uh, maple syrup to start with. And this is where the soft maples come in. We weren't making our own maple syrup at Merle Maple to have a low enough, a less than a half a percent invert sugar. So we looked around at our neighbors and found a bunch that had um, about 40% red maples or soft maples. And then their, their invert levels were very low. So we would you know, check each drum as, as we were gonna purchase it and um, find the ones that were low enough. Usually they would come out low on the glucose glucometer and then I would take them back, take samples back and test them on the YSI so that we knew exactly what our um, invert level was in our coating syrup. We mix about 800 gallons of maple syrup for maple sugar candy at a time and in a big tote. And that way we have consistency in our products. Um, high quality and consistency are just important things. Um, so the reason we didn't have as low of invert sugar is we had a lot of yeast in our lines. Um, we have buried lines and we, we, even though we were trying to clean them, we weren't cleaning them with the right products. So we've switched products that we're cleaning with um, and we're, we're getting our lines cleaner. Our invert levels this year are actually pretty good. Um, we came up with a 0.6 already this year from a little bit of about 300 gallon of syrup that we've made. So we could mix that with some other lower invert sure, inverted um, syrup and still use some of our own. And this will be the first year in about 10 years, over 10 years that we've used our own maple syrup to make our maple sugar candy. Um, we make about 5,000, about five ton of maple sugar candy in a year. Um, not right now, we coat them, we make the maple sugar, we coat it with maple syrup, and we have a shelf life of about six to eight months. And we really attribute that to having the invert levels so low. Um, okay, so, so after we cook the syrup, we start with a three gallon batch. We put it in this um, container vessel, and then we vacuum cool it. So this is just the start of the vacuum cool. You can see it's starting to come back to a boil. So it was approximately 236 degrees. Um, we dump it into this cold vessel, which is clean. We make sure there's no crystal in there. And then we vac put it under vacuum. Right here, it's only about 10 pounds pressure, but it'll go up to over 25. And when we get, the temperature gets down to 150 degrees, we take it off the vacuum and we stir it on the mixer. So here, this is like midway through stirring. It started to change color, but it's still pretty glossy. And this will almost dry right down. We add back a little bit of water and then we uh, put it, you get a cookie dough consistency like this. And then we transfer it to the um, Sunrise Sugar Machine. The Sunrise Sugar Machine has a pump that pumps it around in a circle here so that, and then it has a three-way valve at the bottom for when we want to fill molds, but it, it continues to stir it as well as mix it. The top of it has a hot water jacket on it, so we can keep that at 150 degrees. So we cooled our sugar to 150 degrees, we mixed it, but then there's some heat of crystallization involved. So it's still pretty close to 150 degrees when it goes in the, in the sunrise machine. And um, we try and keep it at 150 degrees. We wanna pour between 145 and 155. And the only way we could do that is because of the um, hot water jacket on this machine, it keeps it hot so that it is flowable and it pours. Um, so then from the machine, we fill it into molds. Here we're filling with a forehead filler. Um, because we do so much, we've developed that, well, We've had help, but we, we use a forehead filler so that we can fill more molds more quickly. 
after they're in the molds for about 45 minutes to an hour, we take them out of the molds. We turn the mold upside down on this mold popper, which just, so the pieces of sugar fall between the slats. We run over the um, back of the mold with a rolling pin and the pieces of sugar fall out. So it's a lot easier than pushing each one out by hand, which is the way we used to do it when I started there. You can see all the molds behind um, Janet here that are waiting, that are you know drying and cooling, waiting to be taken out of the molds. Then we use these trays that she's pushing it out onto to scrape off the, um, the little hairs that were the here, these pieces. We just scrape the backs of them a little bit and the, that piece falls off. And then we end up with a nice flat back, um, which makes it a lot easier to um, pack in a box. It'll lay flat. Then we let the maple sugar candy sit for 24 hours. The next day we put, load it in these baskets. Um, and then I cook the syrup that's in the bottom here. I've cooked it to 63 and a half bricks hot. Um, each time we make maple sugar candy and want to coat it, we reheat our coating syrup to that temperature. And then this has a water jacket on it so that it cools it. We put the syrup in there, we let it cool to 100 degrees, and then we put the baskets down in. The baskets are in for 12 to 14 hours. And then the way they're sitting right now is in their draining position. So um, someone comes in in the morning and picks the baskets up and puts these little boards under them so that they sit there and, and drip dry for about an hour before the crew comes in and starts wiping them. Unfortunately, I didn't think to include a picture of the wiping. I wish I had, but each we have a machine that has rollers on it that allows um, the top and bottom to be wiped simultaneously. So two people take off the machine and put it on their trays individually, not touching each other. And then um, we have four other people that do hand wiping. Okay, next product. Um, maple spread or maple cream with a longer shelf life. Um, that is the part to stress here. If you don't use the inverted syrup, like I'm gonna to explain to you, and you try to do this through either a normal machine, it will set the machine up. But the inverted sugar causes it to be a little more pliable and it um, lets it flow. So I do have some pictures of that also. Um, your initial syrup, you want it to be a one to 3% invert level. So still, you don't want it to be real high. Most people don't have a real high invert level, but um, you know you do want it to be fairly low. And then your finished product is gonna be about 15% inverted sugars. Inverted sugars, the, the fructose especially, is um, a sweeter product, which with your maple spread, that's really what you're going for anyway because you're gonna put it on toast or English muffins or something like that. And you want it, you know, the sweetness is desired. Okay, so this is just a brief overview of what I'm going to explain. Um, but first I need to explain this. We dump a half, it into a half gallon of 100% inverted syrup. Um, so we, we take a drum of syrup and we, because we make so much cream, we make, um, we, we make about 800 gallons of syrup into cream in a year or spread. So we just invert a whole drum all at once. So we take a drum, add about a cup of Invertase to it. Um, and we warm it with a, belt, a drum warmer for about 48 hours. Um, you don't wanna get it too warm. You only want it to go to about hundred degrees because if you get it too warm, you kill the Invertase, which is just an enzyme. It, which you know is our true advantage later because then when we actually make the spread, we um, kill the enzyme and you don't need to put it on your label. It's just a process aid. But we make a drum of 100% inverted syrup. And then I just take a half gallon of that and I warm it to 100 to 150 degrees so that when I dump the, uh, the rest, the other part of the three gallon batch, the two and a half gallons into it, um, it doesn't shock it quite so much. So I start with two and a half gallons of amber syrup, approximately a 70% transmittance. I cook it to 248 or 36 degrees above the boiling point of water. 
And then I'm gonna to go to the pictures now. So here is my half gallon of 100% inverted syrup. It's not cooked at all. And that's why we're cooking to a higher temperature of 248 or so, um, depending on your elevation and everything. Um, and I just, this is just warm to 100 to 150 degrees. And then I'm gonna dump my um, other two and a half gallons into it. So I've had to overcook my two and a half gallons, essentially take it to a higher temperature to compensate for the fact that that half gallon was not cooked at all. So there it is dumping it into there. Um, then this bowl is carried to the cooler, put in a cold water bath and it sits there overnight. So it goes down to about 40 degrees. We can actually make, um, there's a cooling unit on the water bath. We can make it form ice if we need to. I usually do when I'm doing a lot of batches. Um, and then I just spritz the top of the bowl a little bit with water so that, that we don't get crystal formulation on the top or formation on the top. So after it's cooled overnight and down to about 40 degrees, we take a few bowls out of the cooler and we add a little bit of um, seed to our machine, our sugar machine, it could be a sugar machine. We have a separate machine for making maple spread. Um, and um, so we put a little bit of seed, which is just a previous jar of maple spread that has been cooked and it's sitting on the shelf and we'll put that in there. Um, crystal formation is a catalytic process. So by having a little bit of your previous product in there, your, your crystals are gonna form more quickly and it's just it's gonna speed up the process of it turning. So after we add that seed, then we're going to um, take the bowl. This is a bowl from the cooler and I'm just gonna warm it a little bit. And if I click on this, you'll see that it moves just a little in the bowl. And that's when I know it's ready to go to the machine. So then we're gonna take it and we dump it in the, the cream machine. And here it comes. You can see it's it's really stiff taffy and there's the chunk. And then we just wipe out the bowl. That little bit that is warm isn't a problem to add to your batch. It's just, you know, you want most of it to still be cold. And the reason you want it to be so cold is the colder it is, the less separation you're gonna get. If you have, like a lot of our um, maple spread goes to farm stores. Not all of them have a place to store it refrigerated. So um, they store it on their shelf and especially on, at room temperature, it's going to separate if you don't stir as cold as possible. You're gonna get some heat of crystallization when you form your, um, your crystals. So the temperature will go from about 40 degrees up to between 70 and 80. We try and keep it below 90 degrees and then we have a lot less separation. Um, if you look at the little video of me, not that I really like being on camera, this is a jar that we've had sitting on, our sh on the shelf at room temperature for three years. And it still has only got just a little bit of separation in the top of it. Um, we've purchased some on supermarket store shelves that it's half maple syrup because it has separated. So the colder you can stir it, the more um, the, or the less separation you're going to get in your product. Whether and we still store it most of the time at, in refrigeration, but that way, if it does sit out, it's not going to separate nearly at the rate that it would if it if it gets too warm when you're um, stirring it. So okay, I must be I went backwards, didn't realize it hit my mouse. Okay, so here it is in the machine. You can see that even though that was a hard chunk of um, taffy, now it has taken to the form of the uh, machine and the machine is working a little bit. You can see it's moving to push this through. Now, if you didn't have the high invert, inverted syrup in there and people saw this, they're thinking, they would be thinking this is gonna set the machine up, but it actually doesn't because of your inverted sugars. Your inverted sugars are more flowable, if that's a word, and it, um, it actually softens up um, so that we can, um, it, it'll actually go around and we'll actually be able to, to um, 
jar right out of this machine. So I'm just going to let this video go a little bit longer so that, you know, you can see that, you know, it does come out in chunks at times, but then it gets to this consistency. So here we've just mixed it up. We use a spatula a little bit to mix and um, it gets to be quite flowable or fluid, I guess is your better word. Um, <laughs> and uh, we can jar right out of the bottom of the machine. This machine has a one and a half inch gear pump. Um, and we actually, this is probably closer to the three batches. So this is about nine gallons in this machine. It's a quite a big hopper. Um, the Sunrise Sugar Machine, you'd probably only be able to put one, well, maybe four, uh, four gallon might be about as much as you could put in that. No, we do put six gallon of syrup in it, of sugar in it though. Okay, so, so six gallon will go in it. Sorry, I'm thinking on the fly. Um, but, but yes, then we just bottle or jar it right out of here into our glass jars and we store it in glass jars in the cooler. Um, okay, so our next um, product is maple granulated sugar. Um, so maple granulated sugar, you want syrup that's got about a 2% or less inverted sugar you want it to be later season syrup with a stronger flavor. Um, and the public tends to um, equate a darker color with more flavor. Um, it doesn't always happen that way, but a lot of times, yes, your darker flavor or your darker colored syrup is gonna give you a darker flavor or a, a, a more strong flavor. Um, so you're gonna use maple syrup with less than 2% invert. You're gonna cook it to 258 to 262 or this above boiling point of water. That was the, that, it, that Steve um, Childs has always told us that we need to boil water on the day that we cook things. So I, I try to include those numbers um, and, and it's gonna depend on your elevation also. So if your invert level is on the higher end, you're gonna to need to cook it to the higher temperature. If your invert level is lower, you might even be able to go a little bit lower. Um, but inverted sugars are more hygroscopic, so they absorb water from the air. So even when you're cooking it, when you're cooking it, and then when you're going to stir it and you're going to steam it off, if your invert level is too high, it may not dry down. So here we are dumping the, um, the maple syrup into our mixer. And you can see this paddle's been used previously. We just run batch after batch. We make about 600 gallon of syrup into granulated in a year at Merley Maple. Um, and then the next picture is the, um, this is pouring it from the bowl into our sifter. We like to sift it when it's hot. Um, that breaks up any of the big chunks that might still be in there. Um, we store it on trays, like in the background here, and then we will clean the sifter up at the end of the day of making it and re-sift the next morning, put it in pails, um, and it will keep in the pail in the five-gallon sealed pails until we're ready to use it, whether it be in cotton candy or just in bags to go on the shelf to go directly to customers or either our customers or um, farm stores, things like that. So, um, so unlike Adam, my talks are always quicker than they should be. <laughs> so I'm a few minutes early, but for summary, inverted sugar is the measure of the amount of glucose found in your maple syrup. Um, you can use a glucometer or a um, YSI to test your glucose amount. Sugar candy, you want it to be less than a half a percent. Maple spread, your initial is one to three percent. Your finished product will be 15 percent for longer shelf life. And I guess that's the big thing. This is really all for, for a high quality, longer shelf life product. Because we make so much of it, it's very important at Merley Maple that we have a consistent um, product that will stay on the shelf because we make large batches. And then the granulated sugar, you want less than two percent invert. Um, 
So at that point, I will take questions. I will stop sharing. Well, I've learned uh, why my uh, my cream machine set up, and it was a bear to uh, <clears throat> clean. So I personally have questions, and I'm going to do mine first before I open it to the ones that have already put it in. Uh, so on your granulated uh, sugar that you just you just mentioned, you put it in a in like a five gallon bucket. Yes. Do you seal that bucket, and do you put it in refrigeration for storage? Um, no. Well, most of the five gallon buckets we have have a rubber O ring on them. Okay. I mean, we have four different styles of buckets. So it's, you know, a challenge to figure out which cover goes on which one, but they all seal off. They have a rubber O-ring, so they are sealed, but no, we actually store them out in our, um, right now we don't have a warehouse. We use semi-trailers and we, we put them out in the semi-trailers. So, you know, in the winter they're cold and, the, and we wait for them to warm up before we open them inside. But then in the summertime, the trailers get hot. They're not refrigerated at all. And they're not even cooled. Um, you know, a semi-trailer is going to bake. So no, we, we don't have to worry about it melting. We don't worry about it absorbing too much moisture that way. Okay. And then when you do a batch um, of, of granulated, what, what could we expect for an average yield on a I don't know what your batch size is, three gallon, five gallon. What will that yield in terms of pounds of granulated? We get um, seven and a half pounds of granulated sugar out of a gallon of maple syrup. Okay. Okay. Um, and, and we do a gallon and a half batches just because that's what our mixers seem to like. Um, it depends how big your mixer is. I know, you know, a lot of people make it with a, a cream paddle. And, you know, it's something I've never done. I've only ever um, done it with the mixers. And my brother even who makes maple syrup and granulated also has a mixer. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, we had a question come in. Uh, can you explain a little more of the crystal coating process? Uh, you, you touched on it. And I guess um, I actually have never seen that process before today. It, if we didn't have the crystal coating process, how long would that, that uh, molded candy stay? Okay, if your invert is low, uncoated will keep probably up to a good two months. Um, we have actually taken our uncoated sugar, we stick it in our cotton candy tub, um, which is a, a, a white, it's not a white plastic, it's not a totally clear plastic, but you can, it's like opaque. Opaque. Thank you. Um, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Sometimes you need help. Um, but we put it in the freezer and store it that way. And then when you take it out of the freezer, we lay it out on a tray so that they're not touching and let them sweat. And that does their own little sort of coating. So a lot of people will get um, maple sugar candy from us that way. Um, if you have a higher invert, you're only going to get one to two weeks out of this uncoated sugar and it'll start to get a white spot because the, you know, especially on the back of it. And if you break it open, you'll have a big white center and that's getting hard because the water is coming out of it. And that's where the crystal coating is keeping that moisture in there. Um, Okay. Well, you, you just took my, uh, my thunder out of my next question. Cause I was like, what are the white spots I get on the candy that I make? Um, and my dad is uh, just for public knowledge. My dad's on this call and he's probably laughing because I can't make candy to save my life. Um, so the white spots are because I've used the wrong invert and I haven't tested it. Yeah. Well, it, and too high of, a uh, um, stirring temperature. Um, if you stir too high, which I mean, not everyone can go down to 150 degrees like we do, because if you, especially if you're doing a pig and the old coil system, which um, is what I have, <laughs> you're not going to be able to get that low because it'll set right up because there's yeah. no, you don't have a hot water jacket. Um, by, by keeping it at 150 degrees with that hot water jacket, it keeps the, it from, from losing too much water. Um, at 180 degrees, which is where you have to stir it, you, you've, you know, you're, you, 
you're losing too much water as it cools. And that's why you're getting that white spot on the okay. back of the pole. Yeah, I made a simple brick because uh, I, I tried to get to 150 and it's physically impossible. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to stop asking my questions. Okay. Um, Just a second. And if, if you ever want to come and see us, we let people come in and, sh and watch while we're making maple sugar candy. Um, so, I mean, I know Michigan is a drive, but it's not forever away. And about, especially with COVID right now, but um, Sunrise gives out <laughs> Merle Maple's name when people want to know how to use a Sunrise machine. They're like, call Merle Maple. They'll let, they'll tell you. <laughs> so we do have allow people to come in and watch us make it and help us oh, make it. <laughs> we've actually shown the video that or, or several videos that Antonio shot uh, mm -hmm. when he visited. So they've been seeing your entire process throughout the day. But uh, we had a question earlier in the day that I was not able to, to answer. Uh, and it came in from Ivy, who has been making uh, maple candy. And she has always heard that you don't use, or, or she's had the experience where RO derived maple syrup has not been able to, hold on, let me, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, mm -hmm. It has to do with Invertase levels. Do you have anything to say as to like RO syrups increasing our like Invertase and not being able to make candy uh, and issues with candy sugaring? Have you ever found? I, I've, we've never found that. Um, I mean, we, I, I know everyone that we buy maple sugar candy syrup from uses an RO. So it really hasn't been an issue. Um, ah. I so it has it, more to do with those those kind of naturally occurring invert levels uh, yes. prior to it ever being at an RO. Right. Because even if you use a UV light, like we put, our sap comes in and we put it through in front of a UV light, but that kills the bacteria, not the yeast. Um, it, the yeast, in order to keep yeast low, I think the best thing is to process it quickly. Um, you know, so that your sap is not sitting around and your yeast isn't growing and to clean your, sanitize your lines, um, sanitize your drops, things like that. Do you, do you, uh, do you chill your sap uh, prior to RO or after ROing? The tank is outside. So it's really just weather dependent. We don't actually have a cooling tank. Okay. All right. Let me. So uh, one, one question came in and the person says, I observed that we make cleaner sap. The flavor of our syrup becomes boring. Uh, it's sweet, but it's lacking the maple flavor. Uh, so is there something going on like chemically from that aspect? Or I, I guess, what do you think? <sighs> You're my resident chemist of the day. Yeah, Okay. <laughs> There's a lot about maple I don't know. Pharmaceutical chemistry is a lot different than sugar chemistry. Um, I always get told I need to go back and get a food science degree <laughs> in sugar chemistry, but I will do my best. Um, a lot in, in recent years, our syrup has not had as much maple flavor, and we've been cleaning lines. Um, does it matter if I say Okay, I do have a, a person here with me, sorry. Um, we've been cleaning our lines with hydroxy sand from Hydrate Chemical for three years now. And um, it's hydrogen peroxide and parasitic acid, which, or peroxyacetic acid, whichever name you go by. And it, does, it breaks down into water and carbon dioxide, so there's no residue. And since we've been doing that, our syrup has gained a lot of maple flavor. It was always sweet. And I think what it comes to down to is your invert level is too high or very high. I mean, last year at the end of the season, we had invert levels of 13%, which most people don't see that. I can't say, I can't think of any other producer that I've tested that has gone that high, but we have a lot of buried lines and they're very difficult to clean. They don't freeze in the winter and they don't um, get hot or and they never dry out. Um, they don't get hot in the summertime and they don't dry out. So 
we flush them in the fall, we flush them throughout the season. But, you know, if you keep having runs and don't have any time to flush your lines, it's your bacteria and your yeast are going to multiply. And we think it's just been so many years of those lines being buried and the yeast has built up that we're peeling off layers of the, ye the, de the yeast that has gone dormant, but um, we haven't gotten rid of all of it. So at the end of the season, we still have high invert levels. Okay. Um, I think it's really important that I I'll jump in. Um, just so those producers that do sanitize know, hydroxysan is... Uh, approved for dairy food, wine, beverage processing facilities. This is this. You want to be very careful what product you use and that it is labeled uh, for a food and beverage industry. There are products out there that people are using. And I know there are people on this call that use products that are not, they are not registered. They are not labeled for food. They are if you look at the label, there are certain things that are registered pesticides. Don't get caught with those. Make sure what you are using and what you are buying is approved. It's labeled for food use. Sorry, that was my formal spiel. Um, so I had a question come in and I'm glad this person asked it and it wasn't just me that was asking the question. If we don't have uh, the infrastructure that you have there at Murley's to do the coding process, how do I do that on a small scale uh, to kind of, I don't want to call it a hobby level, but how do I start doing it to see if I want to add that to a product line? You, we used to do some in bowls. Um, you can um, cook the syrup. Okay, I, I was given a note here that we have an old um, hydrometer that um, our 59, our SERP is normally SERP at, at 59 bricks, which I think that's normal. But so then you need to go four and a half bricks higher for your coating syrup. So if you cook your SERP four and a half bricks higher than your, your normal syrup at your elevation and with your equipment, um, you'll have it thick enough for coating syrup and then you let it cool down to about 100 degrees and then you put the sugar in it and you cover the bowl with a, uh, a plastic tray and then co um, cover it with a, a, a cloth to keep it warm and you want it in about a 70 degree room, room overnight and then you dump it out onto a, uh, in a wire bas basket, a colander or something like that and let it drain. And then you just take a damp, um, um, non, uh, uh, non fibrous towel. Um, what are those towels called? Microfiber. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and just blot it dry. You don't want to leave it on the towel too wet towel too long, but just take off the excess. And then you can put it on a tray without it touching other pieces so that it can dry and you can do it on a small scale that way. That's awesome. All right. Any folks have questions? We have, we have time oh, and uh, you're, you're talking to like a national expert here on making candy. Oh, somebody asked, can you say again the name of the cleaning product again? So they're using a product called hydroxysan, if I'm not right? Yes, it is. It's hydroxysan. And um, it's from, we get it from Hydrate Chemical. Um, it is also organic certified. And yes, it is meant to be used in the food industry. It has actually not been approved to be used on porous surfaces. surfaces. And unfortunately, they consider... Um, tubing and plastic line as porous, but you know what? It, it is in the food industry at least, and it, it's really working very well for us in knocking down our yeast issue. Okay. All right, so we had that. Hmm? But yeah. Oh, okay, so so the the comment is if the tubing is porous, wouldn't the sugar come out of it or the, the liquid come out of it too? So, but it does have bigger pores than say a stainless steel. Um, so that's why we're willing to try it 
and it's working very well. Uh, one question I, I have is um, if we are labeled organic, do we have to account for the invertase that we are adding into, like you add that uh, in, into the drum of syrup, you add invertase? No, because when you heat it up above 150 degrees, you're killing it off and it's gone. It, you know, it's no longer, it's um, deactivated. That's the word I was looking for. Um, okay. So it's just considered a process aid. It does okay. not have to go on your label. It does not have to be accounted for as a chemical. Okay. And I know I missed it and I apologize, but how much do you add per drum of syrup? And I take it the drum is 30, 40 gallons? Um, we add about a cup to a drum. It's, uh, I believe it's a tablespoon per gallon of maple syrup. Okay. I'm 95% sure on that. And if you, if it's, I will double check on that, Jesse, okay. and let you know for sure if it's Thank different. You. And if I look up Invertase enzyme, are they all the same or they come in different strengths? Pretty sure they're all the same. Okay. We buy a gallon of it and it does expire. So a lot of times, like when we do our um, midwinter conference in Syracuse, normally we take a few bottles of, of, of the cream size. So, you know, an eight ounce cream jar and we'll sell it to people for $10 because they don't need a lot of it. We go through the gallon before it expires, but um, no, they're pretty much all the same strength and, you know, but, but we have been known, we would also ship it to people if they want to just buy a small jar. I believe it's 10 or $12. And, okay. you know, we would ship it to you with the directions and the expiration date on it. Okay. And then uh, another one, when you, so it just came in, when you, um, you, you talked about partway through seeding uh, uh, the cream, mm -hmm. uh, I guess it was the cream. Yes. Can you actually this is going to sound weird, but can you seed different size crystals to make different creamy products? Meaning if you have a market that wants a more granular type versus a more creamy type, can you seed it with different crystals initially? You can. It, it's also going to deal with a lot with your stirring temperature, um, just like maple sugar candy. You know, we, we believe stirring at 150 degrees with maple sugar candy gives us that nice creamy um, center. But with the maple spread or maple cream, um, a, a, yes, you could seed it with different size crystals if that's what you want. Um, we okay. always go for a nice, smooth, um, product. I, I know some of the judges at um, fairs, that's all they look for is, is, is extremely smooth. <laughs> and one of Dream. the judges is Jesse's father. So. Oh. <laughs> so the moral of the story is buy a jar of Merle maple spread and then use that to seed your own. I there didn't. you go. <laughs> um, no. Okay. We Any just, other? What? Okay, I'm going to put a plug in for... Um, Merle Maple. We do sell a lot of our products unlabeled to other producers. Um, I don't know if Monica Polk is Polk Around Farm is on the webinar today, but she buys product from us. And, um, you know, we do ship to a lot of different people unlabeled as well as labeled. Okay. Um, so I just had a few more pop up now. Um, so why, uh, why does some of my syrup sugars so much in the jar um you've cooked it too thick you you've take you know your maybe your hydrometer is not quite right um if you i don't know if you either get a different hydrometer or um find someone who has a digital hydrometer um we have one at merle maple that again the genesee valley regional market helped us purchase with that grant but you know, we have checked other people's hydrometers to make sure that they're reading properly. They do get old. Okay. And then a, another one, and, and I'm really interested in your, your YSI meter. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just because that, that shows kind of, you know, you guys uh, offer a service and, and kind of in Western New York. If, if I wanted to replicate that here in Michigan for our producers and down into Wisconsin, what am I looking at for a, uh, for a cost for that 
YSI meter and, and what are the maintenance costs that I should be incurring if I want to provide that as a service to our producers? Um, the YSI itself was about 3,000, 30,000, 25, okay. Somewhere between 100 or 1,000, 100. So, okay, I'm sorry. That's a good thing Lyle's here. Um, it was between $25,000 and $30,000. So it was an expensive piece of equipment. Um, the membranes, I think I, I don't do, a, I mean, we do a lot during the maple season and then I have a few bourbon samples throughout the year, but I actually shut the machine down part of the year so that I don't have to keep the buffers and everything. I think I spend about $2,000 a year on buffers, membranes, the membranes, especially the alcohol ones don't last very long. Um, the ones I have right now, I got in October and they expire in March. So, I mean, some of them, it just depends how many, you know, how long your expiration date is when you get them. But so, I mean, it, it is substantial to keep upkeep on a yearly basis. Yeah, but it's almost, I mean, it's such a great service that you guys have going on there. Um, Okay. Very nice. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I just got a text from Antonio uh, that he has your, um, your video. So if you don't want to watch yourself, uh, when we finish, we do want to highlight to those that are watching that we will um, play the maple. I think it's a maple candy video um, that, that you helped us with. And, and uh, so all of those videos we will have online and, and you will be a star. You know, I have actually never had chance to watch them myself. <laughs> oh boy. So, you know, we, we uh, appreciate you being here uh, on a Saturday. If anybody has any last minute questions. Um, oh, here it is. Uh, there's another one that just came in. Would the spread also work for creamed honey? Boy. You mean I guess I don't understand the question. I, I'm hoping he means the machine. We, we happen to have a bee person in the room. Oh, <laughs> is Lyle sitting right there? Well, Lyle is here, but Deb Welsh is also here. Oh, that's lot right. So, this is normally when meetings go far, you know, way off the rail. What's the process? We don't, I don't have any idea. Okay. Did you hear that? No. Okay. Okay. I wasn't sure. Do you want to come over, Deb, and do it again? Okay. <laughs> um, Deb says that honey creams naturally. It's not something that you put it in the machine and, and do it. Um, and she says she's always thrilled when it actually happens naturally. She has tried taking some of her honey cream and seeding it like I did with the, um, maybe that was actually the question um, to get, you know, to get it to the catalytic process, but it appears it's not the same in honey as it is in maple. In maple, you can definitely seed it, but I don't, it, it, I mean, it's not the same. She can, she, uh, Deb says it's not the same in if you seed it as if you just if it just happens naturally she, they believe it's a what did you say a, okay okay so it's a pot they believe it's a pollen that makes the honey cream and once it creams it never separates wow okay so there was also a uh, do you have to be a certified kitchen to make and sell maple sugar products? And I know that is very state by state specific. Um, what, what do you have to do in New York to, to make and sell confections? 
you have to have a kitchen exemption, a home kitchen exemption to make the pure maple products. No, you don't even have to do that. No. If it's pure maple, you do not need to have an ex any kitchen approval. If you make combined products, um, value added products, say taffy, or not taffy, but um, what? Nuts, coating nuts, things like that. Um, you have to have a home kitchen exemption. We do a lot of products also with vinegar. Therefore we have in New York have to have a 20C license ex, um, inspection. So we're inspected three times a year by Ag and Markets. Okay. Now, do you, uh, given that the, the nut allergy thing is, is uh, terrifying for, for parents that have children that are, that are uh, uh, nut allergic, do you have different product lines that make uh, coated nuts versus, you know, your granulated sugar or, uh, how do you clean in between if you're using the same equipment? Um, right now, we currently buy our nuts from another maple producer. We don't make them in-house. Um, I am actually sending that question off to my Ag and Markets inspector to find out what we need to do to someday bring that process in-house. We're thinking we have to put in a separate room, but I don't know the total answer to that. Right now, we only package the nuts in our facility and we package them in a separate area than we do anything else. And we do specially clean up afterwards to okay. prevent cross-contamination. You know, and, and I think that's really important that people hear that. And I think it's also important that since we have 13 states represented on the call today, I think it's very important to know your own uh, laws in your mm -hmm. own community, your own state. Uh, when in doubt, contact your local extension office, contact your local MDAR or not MDAR, your Department of Ag, uh, those that regulate maple or certified kitchens. It's better to ask rather than just, you know, you heard what New York does. It's better to ask in your own individual state. So um, just don't take, don't, don't throw Eileen under the bus and, and no. say, well, you know, she said it. So 